Hi. Nice to see everyone. Um, welcome to the kitchen sessions. Uh, well, you're not in my kitchen, as you can see. You are, in fact, in my dining room because my Wi-Fi doesn't work in the kitchen. So this is about as close as we could get. Uh, like many of you, I've had to kind of carve out a spot in the house where, where I can do some work, and this happens to be, to be my office for the time being. So welcome. Uh, my name is Dr. Glenis Holt, and I have the uh, lucky job of being part of the forensic psychology team at the University of Te Chester. It's a great team, um, and, uh, you know, we've got a lot of experienced lecturers here, and I'm lucky enough to be part of those. Uh, now, I know that a lot of you are tuning in because you're joining us next year, uh, and we're really looking forward to, to having you as, as, part of our, as our, part of our degree program. Uh, now, I know also a lot of you are tuning in because this is just a topic that is of interest to you and, and false confessions are really interesting. They're a really intriguing topic and they're also a really frustrating topic because, you know, we, we get to the point where we think, you know, well, why are people going to falsely confess to, to something that they didn't do? So it's really interesting. So if, you, if you're tuning in just to hear a bit more about that, um, we're really happy to have you. Uh, in terms of uh, looking at questions throughout this, this short talk, you're welcome to just fire away, give me questions or put comments uh, in the chat. Uh, if I don't get to them while we're talking, we'll certainly deal with them at the end. But, but please do talk to me because I'm really interested to, to hear your thoughts on, uh, on this topic. So what I want to talk to you about really is, is not so much how false confessions occur, um, although that's an interesting topic in itself, but what I want you to, to really think about is how do false confessions end up being used as a piece of evidence against somebody who is completely innocent of the crime, they've got nothing to do with it. And one of the, the things that we need to consider, first of all, is that when you confess to a crime, what you are actually doing is creating a piece of evidence with your words. Now, that piece of evidence would otherwise not have existed, whether you're confessing truthfully or falsely. Um, this, is, this is now evidence that has come into existence because you have uttered those words, and it will always exist. Now, you can actually retract a confession, and that's important to know. You can say, you know, I was coerced into giving this confession. Uh, I wasn't aware of, of what was really happening. I didn't understand the consequences. You are certainly able to do that and to give a retraction. However, the thing to know is that that doesn't make the confession go away. The confession will always exist. It will now just exist alongside that, um, that retraction. So why is this important? Well, because that confession true or false, can become the basis, the entire basis of a case against you. Now, if you uh, have been following the, the case of Brendan Dassey in Making a Murderer, you'll understand what I'm talking about when I say that it, confessions are really hard to shake. You know, they can be very difficult to, to sort of get away from once you've given them. Now, Brendan Dassey was 16 years old. He has a low IQ and he didn't have a parent or advocate in the police interview room with him when he confessed to sexual assault and murder. Now, Brandon's confession itself is not particularly great. When you actually watch the video of him talking to the, the police officer, and the jury did see these, these interviews with him, he doesn't really sort of seem to know what he's talking about and, and he has to kind of be led to every piece of information that he's giving. Um, and the confession that comes out at the end is really a result of the information that has been kind of fed to him along the way. So as a jury, you might look at this and go, well, this is a terrible confession. Well, why didn't they? Because they did convict Brendan. He spent 12 years in jail and is due to spend another 28 years in jail despite, you know, his legal team's best efforts. So what is going on with this confession that you should be able to look at and say, well, it's awful. You know, why is being accepted? So I guess what I would like you to do is to really think about yourself in Brandon's situation. And I want you to imagine that you've been brought in to a police interview uh, to be 
sort of questioned about a murder that you've got absolutely nothing to do with. And you know perfectly well that you've got nothing to do with this. You know, you're not under any kind of, you know, delusions. You're not confused. You know you're completely innocent. So one of the things that might happen is that you waive your rights and you just talk to the police because you, you know you've not done anything wrong. Now, all of a sudden, that questioning kind of changes from, you know, discussion about the crime to discussion about your involvement in the crime. And if you're innocent, you're going to push back against that and say, look, you know, there's been a horrible mistake and I've got nothing to do with this. And the police officer, if they're pretty sure that you're guilty, are going to keep pushing back against you and you end up in a bit of an impasse. And what I'd really like you to do is think about at what point would you confess or would you at all? So, you know, just take a moment and think, you know, what is my actual breaking point? So if you want to, you can you can drop them into the, the chat bar, but think about what do you think would make you confess to murder if you if you hadn't actually done it? Oh, you're all quiet. Hopefully you're all thinking. Okay. If you're struggling to think of a good reason why you might confess to murder if you hadn't committed it, you are not alone, okay? What you are fundamentally doing is having the same problem as every juror ever, okay? Why would somebody falsely confess to something, you know, if they, if they didn't actually do it? Yeah, so somebody has said, so Kelly said, you know, if they're holding you for hours and hours and they promised you could go home, yeah, okay, so that's a really, you know, key piece of psychological manipulation. Like if you just tell us this thing, tell us what we want to hear and then we'll, you know, let something good happen to you. You know, it's, it's you know, quite manipulative, especially if you are somebody like Brendan who, you know, doesn't necessarily understand to, you know, a higher level what's going on. Yeah, so, you know, people saying that they wouldn't confess, yeah, absolutely. Or, if, you know, so somebody was, um, one of their loved ones had been sort of threatened with this, okay? So thinking about protecting people, um, you know, that just feeling really threatened, um, having false promises made against you, and some good points there that, that ultimately, you know, you wouldn't confess. Okay, so what I want you to do is just hold that understanding of what you think that breaking point is because all of those are generally quite high breaking points. Um, and in reality is that, believe it or not, the thing that is going to make you falsely confess, it's going to sound like a truism, but the thing that is going to make you confess to that crime is actually because you know that you're innocent. And it's a little bit of kind of mental gymnastics to work your head around this, but actually what happens, and we know that this happens, is that people underestimate the consequences of falsely confessing because they know they're innocent. They know that it doesn't matter if the police have fingerprints from the crime scene or blood spatter or any of that sort of It doesn't make any difference. They, they know their DNA is not there. They know there can be no witnesses against them. They know that none of that evidence can say that they're actually guilty, so they confess because what they're trying to do is avoid that short-term discomfort that a lot of you have mentioned, you know, of being in that interview room and getting away from that person. The police officer doesn't believe them, no matter what they say. What they're trying to do is get to somebody who does believe them because it's so unbelievably obvious to them that anybody should be able to see that they're innocent. They can't figure out why the police officer doesn't believe them. So, you know, they're just trying to find somebody who believes them. So they're pulling away from that incredible pressure of the interview. It's exhausting. It's infuriating. It's frustrating. You feel really hopeless. Um, you're just trying to get out of that. So in order to take away that short-term discomfort, they underestimate the long-term consequences of confessing because they just simply don't believe that, it, you know, that there will be long-term consequences. And in doing so, what's happened is you've just created a piece of evidence that's so solid that it will actually trump DNA evidence. And I know this is really surprising to people because, you know, they don't think that that's the case, but it really is um, that powerful. So now that the evidence of your guilt has been procured, that confession, no matter how terrible it is, no matter how many holes are in it, that is going to start contaminating all of the actual independent evidence that should be proving you innocent, all that evidence that doesn't actually relate to you is now going to start skewing itself 
so that evidence that was previously exculpatory, so that is evidence that proves your innocence, or evidence that's ambiguous that, you know, shouldn't necessarily say either way who's involved, is all of a sudden going to start implicating you once your confession is known. And this is really interesting. So this is known as the, the, the snowballing bias effect. Okay, so all this evidence that should be independent of proving your innocence is going to go the other direction. Okay, so we've got corroboration inflation. So we can think about this over a couple of different levels. One of those is witness evidence. And if you're studying for A-levels, you probably know the study that I'm talking about here. But basically what you think about is that a witness is independent, okay? So they should be reporting the actual facts of the crime. Now, if you're innocent, none of those should point to you. But so research has shown us that if you set up a crime and then you give people a lineup that does not contain the, the suspect in it from that crime and you say to them, you know, pick the suspect for me, of the people who say, well, the suspect's not there, if you go back to them later and you say to them, okay, I know you said that no one was there, but just so you know, this guy confessed, 50% of those people will say, oh, yeah, that's right, it was him. No, it's not. Okay, so this is already an indication that that evidence can be moved around. So somebody who's sure they weren't there in the first place and now sure that the wrong person is there. Okay, so the holes in the confession that you think you should be able to drive a truck through are all of a sudden getting patched up with actually really good evidence. Now, it's not only lay people who are, you know, sort of subject to this kind of bias. There's also forensic confirmation bias. Now, Consider the situation where you've got a police officer and they've got um, some fingerprints from the person who has confessed and they've got some fingerprints from the murder scene. Now, what should happen is that you go to a forensic analyst and you say to them, I've got these two, two sets of fingerprints, can you see if they match? But if you actually say to them, you know, I've got a set of fingerprints from the murder scene and this is the guy who confessed, can you tell me if they match? Research has shown to us that, in fact, that increases the likelihood that those fingerprints will match even if they don't. And this is really concerning because now we've got a lay witness that says, yep, that was absolutely them, and we've got a forensic expert that says these fingerprints match. So your claims that you were never at the crime scene are not looking good, and you've also confessed, so you've also got this nice solid piece of, a piece of evidence that, that's coming into it. Now, it's not just about that as well. It's not just about the evidence that the police have that is suddenly going to be skewing around because of this corroboration inflation process that we know happens. It's also the evidence now that could have exculpated you, so could have proven your innocence, that no longer exists at all. So what happens when you generate that confession? And you probably know this from watching, watching police shows, you know, it's the, the kind of... The, the grander version of it where, you know, the, the baddie confesses and everyone high fives and goes to the pub and the investigation ceases altogether. Well, it's not quite that extreme, but certainly what happens is that whole sections of the investigation that might be looking for a suspect and looking for those leads are going to basically shut down and the focus will narrow to the evidence that proves the guilt of the person who has just confessed to that crime. Now, there's a few problems with that, as you can probably imagine. One of the things is, is that you're not going to be following up on witnesses who might have seen somebody different or who might have categorically seen that, you know, was not the person who confessed. Um, you might have other leads that are not, not being followed up. And really frighteningly, you're going to have suspects who are just sort of fallen off the radar or they're put on the back burner or they're just never even questioned at all. So, you know, you've got evidence that potentially would inculpate, so prove the guilt of, of somebody else and exculpate you that is just no, no longer in the, in the mix of the investigation. So what else have we got? We've got um, all of this, this sort of really sanitised version of the confession with all this evidence proving that it's correct that's now pointing inwards that should be pointing outwards away from the suspect is presented in court. Now, you've already got jurors who categorically struggle to understand why anyone would falsely confess in the first place, um, but now they've also been presented with all this fantastic evidence. 
including often DNA evidence. Now, this one's interesting. So DNA evidence is one of the, the types of forensic evidence that is really solid and that we should be paying attention to. There's plenty of bogus forensic science out there that's slowly being, um, you know, sort of questioned and removed. Um, but DNA is good and we, and we should be looking at it and we should be trusting it because it is quality. So you end up in, the, in a funny situation and prosecutors end up in this funny situation where they've got somebody who's confessed to the crime and then they've got DNA evidence from the scene that doesn't match that person. And they have to kind of explain away and create these, these sort of theories as to why this might be. And some of them end up, you know, quite fanciful. And uh, so some of the ones that I've heard are that, uh, that, that well, yes, there, there's two killers and, um, and that the person who confessed is simply not giving up their accomplice and their accomplice left all their DNA on the scene and, you know, the person who confessed has, has done a really good job of cleaning this up. Um, you know, it might be something like that the person who confessed killed the person, cleaned up all the DNA, and then somebody else came along later and tampered with the crime scene and that's the actual problem. Now... They might kind of sound really laughable to you, and some of them actually are genuinely laughable, except that juries accept them. And why do they do that? Because it is easier to believe the wild theory of a prosecutor as to why that DNA evidence that should be exculpatory is, you know, not matching um sorry, should be inculpatory, is not matching the confession, than it is to believe that someone, somebody has falsely confessed to a crime. So, you know, it's just such a strong belief um, that we'll do anything to kind of hold on to it. So we're kind of ending up with this real sort of contamination snowball that's going on. Now, one of the things that we know that can help fix this problem and to, to help juries sort of see really the, the kind of layers underneath that confession because the whole process is really invisible to them. You know, there's no way that they can see, you know, all of this information. They might not ever know that that, that, that witness has changed their mind. They might not know the leads that aren't followed up. One of the ways that we can help jurors understand that better is by presenting expert false confession sort of testimony on the stand, okay? So we can have experts who um, know the, the psychology behind false confessions, you know, they know all the science behind it, you can get them to, to come up and explain to witnesses. So we certainly have that in terms of, um, you know, experts who come in and explain, you know, how expert, how um, eyewitness testimony or how interviews with children work and things like that. It's very, very rare that anybody will let a false confessions expert up on the stand. And what that means is that all of those layers that I've been talking to you about, and a lot of them are fairly counterintuitive, that your jury's never actually going to know about those and they're just having to rely on their own understanding of the world um, of confessions, which is quite flawed. Now, what I want you to think about really ultimately is what is the cost of all of this? And why is this so important that we understand it? And I, I think fundamentally the most important issue here is that when somebody falsely confesses to a crime, what you've got is multiple victims. So you have the victim of the crime who will either never see justice or will have a seriously delayed justice. You also have the innocent person who confessed to the crime and all of their family. So that person is potentially incarcerated for a long period of time for life or if they're in certain sort of, you know, states in America that potentially they're facing the death penalty and losing their life. But the other thing that we know is that when real per perpetrators have been found later on um, in false confession cases is that often what you're seeing is somebody who has gone on to commit multiple other crimes. Okay, these are not one-offs. Um, so you will have multiple other victims that have been created because that person is just out there in the world completely unchecked. So what I want you to really take away from this is, is not just how it happens but what the importance of this is um, and how we can use psychology to, to better understand what's going on and, and to better educate people. Thank you so much for, for listening to me. <laughs> talk about my area of great um, passion and interest. So um, what I'm going to do is, is have a look through. There's lots and lots of comments coming through, which is fantastic. So I'll have a look through them and, and talk to you about some of the things that you really find interesting. 
Yeah, so people are talking about the things that they're watching, so confession tapes, making a murderer. I think one of the most important things that you can do is actually just go and watch all of those and see the processes behind them because it's one of the ways that we can actually understand um, and those a bit better and especially having them illustrated in front of you. You know, you've got two seasons of making a murderer. It's it's pretty uh, thorough investigation of that. Uh, yeah, so, so people talking about things like, fight or flight uh, in terms of being in a police interview is that, you know, just just being really hemmed in and being helpless can make you sort of react in a way that you don't think that you would and that you might, in fact, confess to a crime that you didn't commit. Um, just being exhausted, absolutely. Uh, there must be lots of innocent people in jail, yeah. So, uh, you know, it's... The numbers are, you know, obviously we're unsure because one of the things about confessions is that they're often really hard to refute, um, especially if there's no DNA evidence. Now, a lot of the exonerations that you're seeing that involve uh, false confessions is because we've now got uh, DNA evidence that can be retrospectively tested to, to see uh, you know, if they actually did it or not. Now, not everywhere, and certainly in the United States, um, it's, it's quite different. So not everywhere will actually allow retrospective testing of DNA evidence. Um, but also importantly is that a lot of crimes don't have any DNA evidence to test. So, you know, think back to you've created a confession, you, you've made this piece of evidence with your words, how can you actually refute something if there is going to be no independent evidence that says that, that you are in fact innocent. So you can see how vast numbers of people are getting sort of stuck in jail. And there's 2.3 million people incarcerated in the US. There's 81,000 currently in the UK. You know, you take a very small percentage of those who falsely confessed and that's a huge number. So yeah, really good point there. That's, um, that's really important to understand. Um, are there any steps being made to combat the prevalence of confessions so less people are wrongfully convicted? Absolutely. Um, and this is a really good point. So, yeah, one of the, the things in that has happened, certainly in um, more recent times in the United States, is that, you know, things like uh, police interviews are now recorded so that you can actually see those steps. So previously you might have a whole series of interviews that aren't recorded and then at the very end when the person, you know, they say, are you going to be confessing now, they press record or that's the point where they take the written statement. So you miss all that nuance behind it that might as a juror um, or even as a lawyer help you unravel what's actually occurred and to really test whether that confession's, you know, good quality evidence or whether it's just nonsense. So that's certainly something that's happened happened recently. Now in the UK, this is this is a process that goes back quite a long time for us. So one of the things that that happened early on is that the UK uh, really addressed the problem of false confessions. So back in 1993, and changed the way that people are interviewed. So a lot of what we've been talking about today is guilt presumptive interviewing um, or guilt presumptive interrogation, which is what happens um, in the States if they use something called the read technique. Whereas in the UK, we follow the PEACE model, which is about information gathering. Um, so what we are doing there is actually using a model that in 1993 was put together by psychologists, academics, police practitioners, lawyers, um, to specifically address a number of false confessions cases that had occurred a number of wrongful convictions. So we've been on that for a while um, and it's one of the reasons why we think that the numbers of wrongful convictions in the States is so much higher um, than places that move away from that guilt presumptive questioning. So yeah, so, so what is happening is, is, you know, it absolutely works. You know, we know how to fix these things, which is really positive. It's massively positive. It's just a matter of the that, you know, that's not the same across all countries or across all jurisdictions. So people are certainly working hard on that. Um, 
Oh, yes, the On Claire Forensic Linguistics podcast. Um, that is a wonderful, wonderful podcast if you've had a look at that. We actually teach forensic linguistics. Um, we, we have a lecture on that in our forensic psychology program, and I have the pleasure of taking that one because my background is also in linguistics. Um, so it's a, a happy joining of my two worlds. And it's very, very interesting. So looking at, um, you know, cold cases and, um, you know, having a look at the, the forensic evidence around that and the linguistic evidence around that. So um, so that's really excellent. Um, but, yeah, absolutely go and check out the On Claire podcast. That one's wonderful. Um, there's plenty of them. And the other one is uh, if you're interested in, in the case of Brendan Dassey, his uh, post-conviction team, Laura Nairada and Steve Drizzen, they've got their own podcast now. I can't for the life of me remember what it's called. I'm sorry. Um, but um, so that one's just come out. So there's masses of information if you are interested in this and you are finding it you know, quite intriguing, especially if you've got access to Netflix or Amazon Prime or something like that, there, there's plenty for you to, to watch. Um, and a lot of what we we talk about in forensic psychology and in our lectures, if you're coming to join us, sort of links back into to all of these resources that that are coming out and that you have freely available. So, you know, it's everything that we do is, is related to, to the science and and peer reviewed research, and we're all involved in that research ourselves. But you know, it's also freely accessible. You know, that there's plenty of um, really topical, interesting things that you can go and watch, especially if you you know happen to have some spare time on um, on your hands. Yeah. Okay. So, do I think that there's any link between this and and racism? Yeah, absolutely. So, what you are looking at in terms of wrongfully convicted people, um, if you go to a website like the Innocence Project, um, you'll find that really interesting. Is that you know you are far more likely to um, be falsely confessing to a crime than to be wrongfully convicted of that. Um, Basically, if you are not white, so and you can sort of see that really sort of clearly. So certainly that is a problem that is being addressed. And you can go and have a look at the really valuable work that the Innocence Project is doing. So yeah, I think that's an important one to to address. Can I recommend a podcast? Yeah, I mean definitely on Claire. Uh, definitely anything that, that is happening that's related to, to any of the shows that you're watching as well. One of the, the interesting things if you're if you're listening to podcasts and there's a show available too is that you're kind of getting those multiple perspectives that's going on. So, I, you know, I personally find that, that really interesting. Um, is this covered in our forensic psychology degree um, at the University of Chester, yes, it is. So uh, we do. So I, I do lecture on false confessions. We also look quite in depth at things like um, jury decision making. So how a jury is actually taking all this evidence. You know, how do you, as a layperson, take all this evidence and make some kind of sensible decision out of it? Especially if some of the evidence is not great. You know, like we've we've seen today that the evidence that's got lots of holes in it, and you know, possibly should be questioning it. Well, how do you actually do that? Um, so yeah, so we certainly do cover these in our degree. It's it's really interesting. <laughs> I'm completely biased, but it you know, it's it's utterly fascinating with the kind of topics that um that that we sort of look at. Okay, so I'm going to kind of wrap it up here um, because I know that at 12.30, Dr. Lindsay Murray is talking about animal psychology and I know that lots of you are also booked in to go and see that, so I don't want to keep you from, from her session. Um, but I just want to, to thank you for, for tuning in and listening to me talk about false confessions and I hope it's given you some inspiration to, to go and research this and also gotten you excited for starting your you know university time with us um, or continuing with your with your research and um, and just continuing with your lifelong learning into into wild and interesting things like people falsely confessing uh, so thank you very much and uh, I will hopefully uh, see you in class soon thank you very much <laughs>